well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking with Cody Wisniewski of the Firearms Policy Coalition. And we started off the week talking about uh, Rahimi with Chuck Michelle, head of the uh, California Rifle and Pistol Association, co-founder of the 2A Law Center. I figure might as well close off the week by uh, talking about Rahimi, as well as the uh, cases that are still pending before the Supreme Court. We don't know what the court is going to do with these uh, half dozen prohibited persons cases, the uh, challenges to Illinois' gun and magazine ban, the uh, challenge to New York's post-Bruin carry laws, at least one aspect of the uh, post-Bruin carry laws, all of which are uh, pending before the Supreme Court, not in terms of a uh, an opinion or a ruling, uh, but whether or not the court is going to grant cert in these cases, whether they will uh, uh, grant cert, vacate the uh, existing decisions, remand these cases back down to lower court, just dismiss the cert petitions entirely, we don't know. Uh, and the Supreme Court is still releasing decisions. They uh, uh, released a number of opinions from this term today. They have more scheduled for tomorrow. And then typically after they release all of their opinions, We'll get the orders from a, uh, a cleanup conference, right? Basically the last uh, conference of the year. And it looks like uh, that's when all these cases are going to be decided. If it's not during the wrap-up conference, then it's going to be the fall before the uh, court would uh, do anything with these cases. So we'll talk about this with Cody Wisniewski here in just a second. Before we do that, though, let's talk about this for a minute. Economists warn that massive tax hikes could devastate your IRA and 401k account as the stock market braces for impact. With inflation on the rise, global uncertainty looming, it's clear why central banks and savvy Americans are turning to gold. If you haven't had your eye on gold, time to make it a priority. Priority Gold. Trust their team of proven professionals to help you diversify your savings with gold and silver. Call 1-800-405-GOLD or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden for a free gold info guide, plus see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Experts agree that physical gold is one of the best ways to fortify your savings, no matter the economic climate. Act now to get your portfolio working for you while the market's golden. Call 1-800-405-GOLD to speak with a gold specialist or visit PriorityGold.com slash golden to learn more. That's 1-800-405-GOLD. And now let's get to our conversation with Cody Wisniewski from the Firearms Policy Coalition's Action Foundation. Take a look and listen. Cody, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the program, sir. Good to see you as well. Glad to be here. All right. So we have had a, uh, a basically a week to uh, to digest Rahimi. Um, let me ask you, I mean, I, you know, having gone over the opinion, the five concurrences, the uh, dissent from Justice Thomas, how bad is Rahimi for our right to keep and bear arms going forward? I will go ahead and take the role of, uh, of optimist. Uh, okay. To Rahimi. So I know that there's been a lot of people going back and forth on, on it. Um, you know, it's certainly not a perfect opinion. No Supreme Court opinion is. But I'll go ahead and, and fill the, the that space of it's not as bad as a lot of people are saying it is. Um, and so some of the positives when you look at the majority opinion are that Rahimi is basically just the court yet again uh, employing the text as informed by history test, right? I mean, it's clear. They don't get into a textual analysis because there is no question that the conduct that is is being complained of or that is being prohibited is protected, right? The ability to possess arms. So the only thing that they have to do is do that historical analysis. So they, we now have every justice on the Supreme Court has signed on to an opinion that lays out the text as informed by history test for the Second Amendment, because Rahimi is an 8-1 opinion. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you know, Thomas is the author of Bruin. So every justice on the Supreme Court has signed off on that test. Well, that means formally and affirmatively, the Supreme Court has said, we're not playing any other game. We're not doing two-step tests. We're not doing interest balancing. I know they said that in Bruin, but of course, you've seen these circuit courts get a little wonky. That, that's not what we're doing. The test in Second Amendment cases is text as informed by history. The other thing that the majority, the other thing to remember with Rahimi is there's a lot of concurrences. There's a lot of dissent, right? There's the majority opinion is 24 pages, I believe. And the overall, uh, you know, written Rahimi opinion with all concurrences is like 108. So there's a significant amount of concurrence and dissent. None of those are binding on 
you know, the future court. None of those are binding on the circuit courts. That's all dicta, right? It's all, it gives us an insight into what those justices are thinking, but none of it is binding on the court. All that matters is that 24 page majority opinion. And that 24 page majority opinion does something that's very important. It limits itself very specifically and says at the end in the conclusion, right? The only thing that we decide today is essentially that the specific fact pattern that Rahimi met uh, was in their eyes constitutional. Now, I'm not necessarily, I'm not saying that, you know, Justice Thomas's history is, is great. He does a great job laying out the historical analysis. He also did, he actually picked up on something from an FPC brief, uh, the FPC amicus brief, where the point that FPC made was, this shouldn't even be a federal police power. This shouldn't even be a question. This should be a state law issue the federal government was never granted the authority in the first place to regulate the possession of arms. That should, it shouldn't even be, it should be outside of Congress's authority to pass any statute like this. So I agree with what Thomas is saying. I agree with his analysis, uh, but I don't think that the Rahimi majority opinion is as bad as some people have made it out to be. Okay. I think that's a fair point. And by the way, apologies for the rooster. Uh, this happens to every time I do an interview. He's like, oh, I'm just going to sit right outside. Yeah, there you go. Thanks very much, <laughs> jackass. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, ignoring the uh, cat calls from the uh, gallery, um, uh, you know, so so let's talk about the history, right? Because this is something where, again, Justice Thomas says, look, the, the laws that were cited by the eight justices in the majority are materially different. Um, than the modern statute, right? And he said they tried to cobble these two different things together. Okay, well, we had the uh, the surety laws that said, you know, if someone was dangerous, we could require them to post a bond. Uh, we weren't disarming them, but we we're going to say, hey, you know what? You got to pony up some significant cash if you're going to be uh, carrying a firearm, and you lose that cash if you commit a crime. Uh, and then the other law was the law against a fray, right? Which is basically yeah. going about uh, armed with the intent to terrorize. And that was punishable by imprisonment. Um, as Justice Thomas said, neither of these are really perfect fits or even good fits for the modern uh, statute prohibiting those subject to a domestic violence restraining order from possessing a firearm. And that's where he worried, right? You know, I've seen all kinds of uh, anal analysis that, you know, Justice Thomas wants to disarm domestic abusers. That That's not what he said. In fact, he pointed to other avenues that could have been used to prohibit Mr. Rahimi from owning a firearm. His concern is that the, uh, the the history that the court looked at um, is, is so tenuous to the modern law that it, that this is going to be cited and used in the future by lower court judges to, again, find these sort of tenuous connections uh, or even connections that don't exist at all between the history of our right to keep and bear arms uh, and, you know, current gun control laws. How concerned are you that that Rahimi may lead to that? I mean, the, the problem you get with any Supreme Court opinion is that people are going to twist it to their end, right? These anti-gun states are going to grab it and try and twist it to say that, you know, the line between the historical law and the modern law is, you know, needn't be very strong. It just needs to be tangentially related, right? We're going to, that is is by far going to be the you know, most challenging part coming out of this Rahimi opinion is that every city, every state is going to... I'm going to read that damn he doesn't have to be trapped in amber line in every brief coming forward for the next 10 years. So I definitely recognize that. And I agree with the people who are, you know, concerned with that. I also agree with Thomas's analysis. I agree that, you know, these laws aren't the fit, like it doesn't exactly line up. I think what's interesting is what we're, what the court is arguing about is, you know, to, to optimism hat again, right? What the court is arguing about is originalism in action. We're not even talking about, I mean, there's no other method of interpretation here. We're talking about the original public meaning of the second amendment. And they're arguing over what is that original public meaning? What is that? And courts are going to get originalism wrong, right? It, it's going to happen. You don't want to see it at the Supreme court. You don't want to see it in this scenario. Um, but we are firmly in that realm. Now we are, you know, gone are the days of balancing away rights. So now we have to, to make sure that our history is strong and sound and that we're advancing, you know, the right arguments and important arguments and analyzing that history in the way it needs to be analyzed. I think where the majority really kind of strayed in this was, 
they really look to a lot of the facts of um, Rahimi's actions and used that to inform their historical analysis almost, almost in a sense, right? You can you can see them discussing a fray and and immediately think back to when they're talking about the fact that what you know got Rahimi finally arrested was that his friend's credit card was declined at a burger shop. So he pulled a gun and shot two rounds into the air, right? Like that's, you know, obviously discharging a weapon in public. That's obviously like, I mean, that's probably falls a lot more closely under a fray than, you know, any sort of order, civil protection order. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can see the majority, I think, unfortunately grab onto some of those really bad facts uh, and really bad things that Rahimi did and use those to inform its analysis. I don't think that this is going to to negatively impact us going forward. I think the, all of the positives in the opinion are going to just support what we're already doing. And in all of these other issues and so many of these other issues, right, the history isn't even a close call. There's not a question. It's not a, well, is there a line here, right? And and Rahimi kind of doing that doing that dance is certainly problematic, but that limiting principle too, right? They focused specifically on not even 922 G8, but 922 G8C1, the very specific part of the that disarmament statute. And the court really limits itself there. I would argue that if you had a civil protect, protective order that went under 920, uh, 922 G8C2, which is doesn't require an actual like determination of, of future dangerousness, mm -hmm. I would say that even under the Rahimi analysis, they would have to strike that down as unconstitutional. Now he didn't fall under that. So, and, right. and so you know, they they went broader, but the analysis is so constrained and so limited to that specific principle. And, and you know, they they made note, uh, not just in the concurring opinion, uh, just as Neil Gorsuch, you know, specifically said, look, here's what we didn't decide today. This was narrowly decided, but even the majority opinion itself took pains to note, right, that this is a narrow decision. This is all that we're deciding today. Um, but that also, <laughs> it, it's kind of frustrating, Cody, because, you know, we, we've we seen in Bruin, I guess all the way going back to Heller, right, the Supreme Court has said, look, uh, you got to look to history. But we're not going to tell you what time period in history, right? We're not deciding that today. And they said that specifically in Bruin. They said it again in Rahimi. We're not telling you what history to look at, which is, Again, that to me is frustrating because it does open the door for, as you say, these these abuses by lower court judges, certainly by, you know, defendants who are uh, hoping to keep these laws in, in place. At some point, the court has to answer these questions. The, it, the court can't just keep saying, well, that's an open question. We haven't said anything about that. OK, well, why not? Why haven't you said 1791 is the date to look at? Why haven't you said 1868 is the date to look at? I'm I'm wondering, Cody, has the Supreme Court resolved that question internally, or are they still debating uh, the specifics of the Bruin test? Yeah, I. It's hard to speak of when you're talking kind of internal Supreme Court, right? It's hard to speak of the Supreme Court as a unit, right? Because right. there are nine different people, and you see that in Rahimi, right? You see this split of opinions. Kavanaugh, uh, you know, I know that the Kavanaugh concurrence has, has concerned a lot of people. And, and that time question is one of the things that comes up in the Kavanaugh concurrence. Um, I I don't think that it's really that big of a question. I do. It is frustrating that the court hasn't just come out and said it. But in several other cases involving other, uh, you know, other amendments, the court has already explicitly said that, you know, 1791 is the time. It's also interesting to me that every time the Supreme Court has encountered this question, it went, well, we don't need to resolve it because it's the same right now. Well, if that's the case, then 1791 is the like that's the appropriate period of time. And so there isn't a conflict here between the history. So uh, it is frustrating that the court hasn't taken on that question directly. I don't think the court will until somebody advances, until they have a case where there is a discrepancy in the history between 1791 um and you know the adoption of the 14th amendment i just don't think that they're going to address the question until there's a very clear discrepancy there and then they'll take it on just because yeah. that's what the supreme court does right it's never going to answer a question that it doesn't have to so i don't think we'll see that but the truth of the matter is i mean we know that 1791 controls that's how it should be and there aren't discrepancies i mean the the right was understood to protect everything and uh and have its full scope i mean 
I don't anticipate it coming up anytime soon. It is certainly frustrating that we continually have to address the question uh, and that we still have to. But I just don't think that, like, practically speaking on a day to day basis in most of our litigation, it really matters because the history is the same. You know, uh, one of the other questions that I raised this with uh, Chuck Michelle earlier this week. Um, what what does what does the history or the tradition entail? Is it just looking to statutes? Is it just looking to local ordinances? Or are you able to look at events? You know, and I bring this up. I was uh, been kind of doing a deep dive on the Reconstruction era uh, over the past few weeks. And, you know, legislatively, I mean, you could look at all kinds of gun control laws that were put on the books in, you know, 1866, 1867, 1868, that either explicitly prevented uh, freedmen from keeping and bearing arms or were used to do that thing, right? So, you know, the gun control advocates say, look, we've got all of these, uh, you know, gun control laws on the books. But if you look at at the events that transpired, you had the formation of the union leagues, right? Why were these laws put on the books? Well, because freedmen were exercising their right to keep and bear arms, and that scared the hell out of the power structure in the Deep South. You mm -hmm. know, they didn't want freedmen armed with breech-loading rifles, right? Maybe if they had a rusty uh, single-barrel shotgun, okay, we're not going to take that away. Um but, you know, it seems to me like the, the the Freedmen and even the Freedmen's Bureau Act, I mean, you can look to some legislation, um, presents this idea that, that, you know, this was a group of Americans who were newly recognized as citizens who wanted the full flower of the rights that citizens already enjoyed. That's all that they were asking for. Um, yeah. So how much of that history is the court going to look at? Are they just going to look at what ended up in law or are they going to look at all of the events that 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 led to that law being created? I think the court looks to context, uh, and I think it has to. Uh, I think it looks to the, the historical landscape. And I think you can actually see that in Bruin, right? When when Thomas is talking about, um, you know, Dred Scott and disarmament surrounding that period of time and that that court opinion, he's looking to context and he is informing his opinion, right? There's a There's a Florida law that looks like a kind of more like a broad arms ban from that period of time. But in reality, what we know is it was specifically enacted simply to disarm freedmen, right? And it wasn't enforced against any, you know, white residents of the state. So we know that, yes, the law on paper might look like it's a straightforward application, but in reality, it was, you know, discriminatorily enacted and was discriminatorily enforced. And I think the court is cognizant of that. So I, I, it is concerning, right? It's something that you have to make sure that that context is included when you're talking about these laws. But the, the court has shown that it will look to and, and properly uh, looks to the the context surrounding the enactment of those laws. All right. All right. We've been talking about Rahimi, but I want to ask about Cargill for a second, because uh, the court has still not taken action on all of the other cases that it has sort of held in conference or or just, you know, held on to. We've got a half dozen prohibited persons cases. We've got the Illinois uh, gun a magazine ban challenge. You've got Antonyuk, um, and presumably the court's going to do something with these cases at its wrap up conference. I guess it could wait till the fall, right? They're under no deadline. Uh, they can decide this on their own time. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. Well, if you want to interject, if you want to, if you want to stop <laughs> me right there and say something, go ahead. Feel, feel, feel well, free. Yeah. I mean, there. You know, it would that would fall pretty far outside of standard practice. Okay. Um, for a lot of these things, for a lot of these pending ones, just to get held over without any sort of of indication of of moving forward, right? Okay. The court generally cleans its docket before it goes for recess or sets things for briefing because then you know the parties have the entire summer to brief while the court is in recess. So we will see something. One thing I'd say is the court seems to be getting. You know, the, the term seems to be getting longer and longer each year. Uh, mm -hmm. It just feels like we're waiting more and more. So I know, you know, today was an opinion day. Tomorrow is going to be an opinion day, they've announced. But they also haven't announced that it's the last day of term. So it, it's, it's, it, there's a world in which this could go into July, I suppose, right? We could get something on Monday or Tuesday. Um some of the cases have been dealt with, some haven't. So coming out of Cargill, right? So we had our, our Gates case, which was a bump stock case in DC circuit. That case has been, uh, was, you know, remanded back mm -hmm. down. So we got the grant vacate remand in that case. So the ones that are directly on point have been addressed. Interestingly, with the primitive persons, 
and this kind of comes into the Rahimi question and how narrow Rahimi is, is the government actually filed a brief in, I think it was five separate prohibited persons cases and kind of categorized them into three groups, categorized them into like other violent offenses, uh, drug offenses, which they deem as not violent in their actual offense, but violent in nature. Uh, because there's, they've perpetually made this argument that the drug trade in and of itself is a violent trade. And thus, even if the specific charge isn't violent, they argue that any engagement in that trade is, is violent. It's a, it's a, one of those interesting government arguments. Um, and then the third category is, um, completely nonviolent. And so the court actually said that, or sorry, the government actually has asked that the court grant one case in each group, uh, almost. And they're basically saying we need to know how Rahimi is going to apply in all of these other prohibited persons cases. So I think that that goes to, you know, the government's almost showing its hand in a sense saying, you know, we recognize that Rahimi doesn't go very far, that it doesn't answer many questions. And so there's a world in which we could get, you know, several grants coming out of that brief where the court goes, okay, well, we'll apply the, the, you know, the Heller, Bruin, Rahimi test to completely nonviolent, right? There's the the range cases up that we've been watching really closely. Mm -hmm. So those are all still potential grants, right? Those are all, you know, potentials for next term. Of course, we've got, you know, the case coming out, cases coming out of the Seventh Circuit that have been held for a period of time. So there's a lot for the court to do yet. There's also still opportunity for the court to grant. We know that obviously Vanderstock is going to be heard next term. So that's kind of a, the, a ne the next step coming after Cargill, right? It's an APA case. It's an ATF rulemaking. It's a question of their statutory authority. But the court has the opportunity to kind of fill its docket with a couple more cases. So we might, you know, we've talked before about how, uh, you know, Vanderstock and Cargill are APA cases, not Second Amendment cases necessarily, right. but... We might have another term where we're getting multiple, you know, gun rights related cases up uh, and having a discussion on them. So, you know, one of the th interesting things about Cargill is you're right. I mean, this was an APA case. This was not a challenge under the Second Amendment. Uh, but the Supreme Court's decision, in a way, did kind of implicate the Seventh Circuit's rationale in in denying an injunction. Right. Because the Seventh Circuit said, well, uh, these laws are fine, uh, we think, uh, because the state's likely to prevail at trial because uh, AR-15s, well, well, they're like machine guns uh, and uh, machine guns can be banned. Well, the Supreme Court just said that a semi-automatic firearm with a bump stock attached is not like a machine gun or, or it not legally, right? Uh, not under the, uh, the federal law. So if that's the case, then it seems to me like a semi-automatic rifle that doesn't have a bump stock attached would most certainly not be like a machine gun. Um, am I reading too much into this? I mean, do you think that Cargill actually could implicate the uh, the Illinois cases? I don't think you're reading too much into it at all. I think it, it implicates the Illinois cases. I think it implicates all of these, you know, so-called assault weapons ban cases. It's, I mean, Sotomayor and in, in her, uh, you know, in her dissent in Cargill, even lays out the fact that AR-15s are explicitly different. She then says that bump stocks, you know, make AR-15s as if they were M-16s, basically. But, but you know, that semi-automatic, of course, I'm using AR-15 as the convenient moniker for a semi-automatic, you know, rifle. But um, I, I think it exactly makes that point. And we actually just, you know, filed a brief in the, you know, district court back where the one of those cases is and made that exact point. I mean... Cargill does a lot to address agency authority. It does a lot to address APA. It does a lot to, to set the ATF back. It's a great, you know, it's a, a fantastic victory. Um, you know, congrats to, to them and to NCLA, who was counsel on that one. You know, of course, we filed amicus briefs in it. Our amicus brief was cited. They pulled our figures, which has now given, uh, some, you know, the anti-gunners some fun ammo to call FPC and FPC Action Foundation extremist organizations and whatnot. So it's been, uh, you know, it was a fun media cycle for sure. But it uh, it also does a lot on that Second Amendment space and in that gun rights space more specifically outside of the APA because the court did have to tangle with and made specific determinations about the actual function of a semi-automatic rifle and how it is distinct from anything else that may be more heavily regulated. OK, yeah, you know, and um, and that case is scheduled to go to trial in September, right? The Illinois case. 
before uh, yeah, it's Judge Stephen McGlynn? It's, it's an interesting one, right? Because the case got sent back down. So we're, you know, briefing at the district court while the petition is pending at the Supreme Court. So it's it's uh, it's procedurally unique. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But yeah, we should we could have something from the district court by the end of the year. Uh, you know, we could have a cert grant by tomorrow. So it, it's one of those that everything is up in the air. Right. Yeah. And and I mean, we've seen the court uh, since Bruin reject basically every interlocutory appeal that, uh, you know, has been sent their way. Um, and it may be that the court says, well, I mean, this case is going to trial in just a few months. We can hold off. But at the same time, they've held on to these cases for some reason. Right. Maybe one or more justices is writing a dissent saying we should grant cert now. We don't know why we will, I guess, at some point in the near future. But um it it it's it would be extremely odd if they just simply denied cert. Nobody said anything at all after keeping these cases for over a month now, right? I think they've been relisted four times. Yeah, yeah, it would be very odd. I would expect at minimum um, a you know a dissent from denial. Maybe they're giving somebody time to write that dissent uh, before they deny cert. But I would expect something. It would be very odd for it to be held this long and then just denied uh, without somebody saying something. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Listen, last question before we let you go here. Um, you mentioned the uh, the the fun news cycle that uh, FPC has had here. Uh, yeah, the media lost their mind over uh, justice, uh, you know, the the, the uh, gifts and the, uh, you know, all the pictures that you use to explain. Apparently, you're not allowed to inform the public. Right. That's that's extreme. Letting people know how a firearm functions, what makes a semi-automatic different from a fully automatic firearm. How dare FPC do that? Now, of course, that's not the only reason why they object. Right. Uh, FPC is uh, too glib. Uh, you guys are, uh, you know, too extreme. You don't care about hurting people's feelings. So what was the response to this news cycle? Did you guys see a uh, a, 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 a an increase in interest from uh, FPC members? I, I mean, I think it, it just shows that we're having an impact. And I think that's the biggest thing, right? So the interesting thing here is the images also appeared in FPC Action Foundation's brief, and we're two distinct organizations. Uh, but of course, for the anti-gunners, they're going to blur whatever line they need to blur to make whatever point they need to make. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of discussion about how FBC uh, conducts itself in public and on social media. And I I don't think a single member was concerned about anything that was said about the organization. I mean, it is it, it's not a secret, you know, how we talk and, and how we engage uh, with the public, but also how we're not going to back down to, you know, anti-rights politicians and tyrants and despots. Like, we just don't care. FPC doesn't care. FPC Action Foundation doesn't care. And so I think it it just energized people and it made them realize that we really are having an impact and that we are able to influence and make sure that these courts are making correct factual decisions, right? The irony of this all is that you're right. It was images on the function of a semi-automatic firearm. It wasn't like this was some sort of crazy, you know, policy legal argument summed up into a, an, an image. It was quite literally a factual recitation about how semi-automatic firearms function. And that was what was, you know, glommed onto. And that was the most evil thing that could ever have been done, apparently. So, it was uh, it was a bunch of fun. If I'm being very honest with you, there was there was very little concern. Our team had a had a great uh, great time with it all and all the comments. And you know, it is it is what it is. They're gonna get if they're getting this upset. That just further demonstrates the impact that we're having. There you go, Cody Wisniewski with the Farmers Policy Coalition Action Foundation. As always, man, thanks so much for coming on the program today. It's always good talking with you. Thanks for having me, sir. Happy to be here. My thanks again to Cody for joining us on the program. And uh, when we do hear from the Supreme Court about uh, all of these cases that are still outstanding, we will uh, be calling on Cody, Chuck, and probably some other uh, legal minds to uh, <laughs> talk about and discuss, dissect uh, what the court's decisions actually mean here. So um, stay tuned because there is – much more to come. All right. Right now, let's get to our uh, good deed of the day, our recidivist report, our armed citizen story. Actually, we have multiple recidivist reports because I, I couldn't decide. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through a couple of these. Here are the headlines here. Felon on probation 
allegedly found in possession of a stolen handgun. What happened to the felon on probation found in possession of a stolen handgun? Well, uh, this was a a, a case out of, uh, I believe, uh, Arkansas. 29-year-old Alan George Hawkins taken into custody shortly after 11 a.m. on Tuesday morning after his uh, probation officer found what turned out to be a stolen handgun and drug paraphernalia in his vehicle. Uh, Hawkins now faces felony charges of possession of a firearm by certain persons, punishable up to 20 years in prison, as well as theft by receiving of a firearm, which is punishable by six years in jail, and a misdemeanor count of possession of drug paraphernalia, punishable by up to one year in uh, jail. He was released on $8,500 bond, by the way, which is not a lot. He is uh, set to appear next week in Garland County District Court. Uh, According to the uh, Hot Springs uh, Arkansas newspaper, Hawkins was convicted back in 2020 of two counts of aggravated assault as well as one count of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. He was given a five-year prison sentence, all of which were suspended. Suspended, meaning he did not have to go to prison at all after being convicted of two counts of aggravated assault, one kind of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. He also has felony charges of third-degree domestic battery and aggravated assault on a family or household member pending from an arrest last August. Trial date has been set for August 12th of this year in Garland County Circuit Court. So, you know, again, here's a uh, violent felon who got probation for his violent crimes. Perhaps unsurprisingly, doesn't appear to have taken that uh, punishment very seriously because now he's been caught with a uh, stolen firearm. Then you have this case out of Illinois. Probation sentence for a Decatur woman with submachine gun. Yeah. Submachine gun. This was actually a uh, a Glock that had been illegally modified with a switch. There was also a uh, quote extended magazine in the uh, firearm, uh, which is prohibited under Illinois law, of course. Right, uh, Danasia Weaver, eighteen years of age. Uh, pleaded guilty to a uh, charge accusing her of aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. Her defense attorney, Lindsay Evans, negotiated this deal where uh, prosecutors agreed to modify the charge to make it eligible for probation. Um, Now, according to Weaver, the gun didn't belong to her. She was the passenger in a car uh, that rammed a squad car in Decatur, Illinois, and then fled from a traffic stop back in January. Uh, City streets, chase reached about 65 miles an hour. Uh, the vehicle blowing through stop signs, traffic signals, and then Weaver tosses a gun out the window. Officer uh, Salvador Ruiz, who signed the uh, affidavit against Weaver, said the weapon was uh, recovered, turned out to be a forty caliber Glock with an extended magazine, as I said, and a uh, Glock switch. Um, Weaver said she only tossed the gun because the driver of the vehicle, a guy named Jackie O'Neill, ordered her to do so. So she gets probation, has to pay a $250 fine, as her DNA added to a criminal database. Meanwhile, what happened to O'Neill, who was the supposed owner of the Glock that had been illegally modified with a switch? Well, he appeared in court back in April, and he pleaded guilty to aggravated unlawful use of a weapon as part of his own plea deal. And O'Neill, at the age of 20, was sentenced to two years in prison, which in Illinois probably means less than a year behind bars. Now, We've heard a lot of talk from Illinois politicians about how and national politicians, right? We've got to crack down on these illegal machine guns. Okay. I mean, listen, possession of a Glock switch, you illegally modify your firearm. Even the possession of the switch itself, even if you haven't put it into a gun, punishable by 10 years under federal law. So why wasn't this case referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office? And why did prosecutors work so extensively to give both defendants plea deals when the evidence appears to be pretty overwhelming. And again, this is supposedly something that we're supposed to take very seriously. So another case where I was just a little flummoxed by the outcome here. And then finally, we've got this one. Teen convicted for stealing deputy's gun. Uh, Elijah Scales. Now, I will say that um, I started looking like I was 40 years old back when I was 18. <laughs> I, I was an old looking teenager. Not that I am admitting to anything. I think the statute of limitations is probably run out. But if anybody in my circle of friends were to have uh, bought beer under the age of 21, it would have been me, right? So I don't want to ding Eliza Skills too much. But man, this is the oldest looking 19-year-old that I've seen since I looked in the mirror when I was 19 years old. Why is he called a teenager in the headline? 
He's a grown man. He's 19. He is an adult. I, I, every time I see something like this where a 19-year-old or an 18-year-old adult is just referred to as 18, to me, I think the media is trying to generate some sympathy here, subconsciously or, or consciously. In this case, 19-year-old Elijah Scales and 20-year-old Jamarius Fields, each charged with theft and unlawful entry of a vehicle after a, a string of break-ins in uh, Indiana in uh, May of last year. Two of the cars in Lebanon, Indiana, uh, belonged to a sheriff's deputy in Boone County, and a gun and a badge were stolen from an unmarked locked squad car, according to a probable cause affidavit. The badge was dumped nearby, and ultimately the deputy got it back, but the gun has never been recovered. Um, Eliza Scales, Lafayette, Indiana, pleaded guilty this week to theft and was sentenced to two years with the Indiana Department of Corrections. But he only has to serve six months of that sentence. And time served uh, means that he's going to get out of jail probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, The remainder of that sentence to be served with the Boone County Community Corrections and on supervised probation. Uh, His alleged accomplice, by the way, Jamarius Fields, uh, did not attend his court hearings in Boone County. He's now wanted on warrants in uh, Boone and Howard counties. But as we've seen before, that doesn't necessarily mean that when he's caught, he's going to get a, a tougher sentence. So. Again, I I just, you know, these three stories to me are a perfect demonstration. Politicians love to talk tough about we got to crack down on violent crime. But what do they really want to do? They want to crack down on you and me and our right to keep and bear arms because cases like this happen every damn day of the year in courtrooms all across this country. Now, something else that happens every day of this year and last year and next year, too. Armed citizens acting in self-defense. Today's uh, story from Albany, Georgia, where a burglar was shot in a break-in at a uh, mobile home park in uh, the Albany area. This was uh, Monday. The suspect, identified as uh, Dario Laney, allegedly broke into a home. Terrell County Sheriff John Bowen says that's when he got shot. Uh, The sheriff not releasing a lot of details about the incident, but they do say that uh, Laney has been arrested. Charged with aggravated assault and burglary. Uh, the uh, Georgia Bureau of Investigation is uh, continuing to investigate the break in. So, again, we don't have a lot of details, but hopefully, we'll learn more information. Homeowner not expected to face any charges. Uh, he was acting in self defense, but uh, yeah, Kadario Laney, on the other hand, he's, well, he's got a, a couple of court appearances in his future. Finally, today, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a uh, Floridian. He was able to pull a man from the water in St. John's County, Florida. It could have been a uh, really dangerous situation were it not for the fact that Luke Cherry was there. Says he uh, normally doesn't hang out uh, at the Alpine Groves Park, but uh, he wanted to take a break from his job at a nearby auto shop. So he was uh, just, you know, sitting there enjoying the sunshine. And then he said he saw somebody that was struggling in the water who appeared to be bleeding. And he said he knew that he had to do something. He said, uh, I realized he was definitely in trouble. I saw his leg was been out of shape, so I was bleeding. At that point, it was obvious what I had to do next. So he got in the water. He said, I just tied my long socks about as hard as I could twice around the upper part of his leg. And at that point, I saw his bleeding significantly reduced. I tried to tie it as tight as I could, making a tourniquet out of his socks. He said that helped him immediately. Absolutely. Yeah, he was gushing blood, Jerry says. Uh, when he got him to shore... The guy disappeared, Uh, and he said uh, he had to go back to work soaking wet. Um, So News 4 in Jacksonville uh, reached out to the St. John's County Fire and Rescue, and they say when the uh, fire and rescue uh, team arrived, the man was at the water's edge, minor injuries, was not taken to a local hospital. Um, Not really sure what happened to uh, cause the man to start bleeding, but uh, Cherry said that he hopes the man is doing well. He said, I did see him as I was hopping back in my car. He gave me a little thumbs up. From the back of the ambulance. So there you go. Glad to know that uh, it looks like everything is okay. Might not have been the case uh, if Luke Cherry decided to uh, take a lunch break, you know, just to hang out at the uh, fast food restaurant rather than enjoying a day at the park. So Luke Cherry in the right place at the right time, willing to do the right thing. We thank you for your very good deed. And I want to thank you for being a part of this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Uh, I also want to thank you. If you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me uh, post something yesterday about Miss E. She is getting ready to go back on chemotherapy uh, and immunotherapy. Not going to be fun, but uh, 
she's 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 ready. She's uh, stealing herself for the uh, suck to come. Um, but she is also trying to stay positive and trying to look forward. So she has entered this uh, contest where she can win a cooking experience with one of her favorite chefs. And I, I asked for help online. I felt kind of weird and strange about doing it. But holy moly, y'all responded in such a big way. So I know I said thank you on Twitter, but I just want to take a moment to say thank you again. Um, if you voted for my wife in this contest, that means a lot to her, means a lot to me. Um, it's been eight years. Since we first discovered a mass in her lungs, we didn't know it was a cancer until September of 2016. But um, it's been eight years of dealing with this. And, you know, there have been a lot of ups and downs, but we try to stay positive and, and honestly, again, try to keep having those things to look forward to in the future. So she's got her high school reunion coming up. For a long time, it was, you know, I've got to stay healthy. I've got to stay well so that I can, you know, homeschool our kids. Um, and this is another thing for her to look forward to. So, Really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, because it means the world to me and to her. Oh, we have a great weekend, and we will be back with you on Monday. Um, not sure who our guest will be on Monday yet, but it's going to be a good one. And then uh, Tuesday, we'll be talking with an armed citizen in Virginia who uh, recently saved two children in his neighborhood from a... Uh, Mentally unstable man who was chasing them with a knife. A, a very frightening situation. You're going to hear again from that armed citizen next week. I'm looking forward to talking with him. But again, looking forward to seeing you back here on Monday. Make sure you check out BarionArms.com throughout the weekend, though. We are keeping you up to date on all the latest Second Amendment news and information. If the Supreme Court does issue its uh, you know uh, final orders from conference tomorrow, we will certainly be keeping you up to date on that. Maybe Monday. Maybe another day next week. We just don't know, but uh, we'll be watching closely. And, of course, we're looking at what's going on beside the Supreme Court as well. So be sure to check out BarionArms.com. If you like what you see, I would encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just use the promo code SAVEAMERICA when you go to BarionArms.com slash subscribe. And you get a significant savings on your membership. Have a great weekend. Thanks again for everything. We'll see you back here soon. Be well. Be safe. And be free.